My first comic book that I ever bought was X Factor 73. World's finest 143. Flash number 150-ish or so. Captain America 258. Fantastic Four Annual 3. Wedding of uh, Reed and Sue. I remember X-Men 205 with uh, Wolverine is on the cover lying backwards. My first comic was an issue of Amazing Spider-Man. Spider-Man in the black costume. X-Men and then the Hellboy franchise. And... I didn't really get into comics until uh, Green Lantern Rebirth came out. I actually don't like comics at all. When I was a little kid, I was obsessed with Batman the TV show and reruns. And from there, rode my bike to the 7-Eleven, discovered the comic book rack. My neighbors next door threw out some X-Men in the garbage. So I was just outside playing one day and I saw them in the garbage. I picked them up. I said, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, I hit, I hit high school and I kind of got out of it. And then after college, I drifted back into comics. And I remember my first thought and what I'm thinking of was I was revisiting friends after a long period of time and getting to know them again. Read them in college, read them in law school, read them on the train commuting into work, read them on the train coming out of work. Everybody's reading New York Times and New York Post. Uh, I couldn't be bothered with that. I was, I was reading good stuff. For me, it began with an ending. In 1992, DC Comics published The Death of Superman, and as a boy of five years old, I was hooked. Of course, 1992 was also the year a new comic book shop opened its doors in Scarsdale, New York. And regardless of how we got into comics, we would all eventually end up at alternate realities. Steve Odo embarked upon a journey from lawyer to comic book retailer. It has been a journey filled with accomplishment and disappointment, friendship and heartbreak, and a dream that would become a nightmare. Welcome to comics. A lot of people in the um, the early 90s, they always thought it'd be cool to have a comic book store. And um, not realizing how much work it was, that it's a business, not just a hobby. Talking to him, learning about that he's done all these things and ultimately decided to come down to comics was, I liked it because it meant that you could go out there and you could do all these things and you could have a kid and try to have a family and ultimately say, I know it's going to make me happy and it might just be running a comic book store. I mean, a guy went to law school, was a lawyer and then said, the hell with it, I want to open a comic book store. That takes a lot of balls. That takes a lot of balls. Our firm started laying off associates one or two every other week. My number came up around January of 92. Most of the others, of course, would continue on looking for another position in another firm. Um, for me, it's like I was so disgusted by the law. At the same time, I was a little wary that I asked myself, and I love Steve to death, but what is he trying to avoid? The day we opened, which is June 19, the day we opened, uh, it was a big success. As time wore on and the magic kind of dissipated, uh, it became a struggle. Uh, actually, I had lost a lot of weight prior to opening the store. And, um, and unfortunately, with the supermarket next door, you know, you'd sit there at night and, and nothing to do, waiting for you know 9.30 to roll around there. Yeah pick up a cake and eat one. <laughs> Very few people seem to get the name. They can't even say it right. So it's alternate realties. People saw alternate in the name and they called and asked if we were a store for marital aids. They call and say, yeah, I was wondering, do you guys sell latex bodysuits? And your first thought all of a sudden goes to, is a Superman costume they're looking for? They look to try to dress up like Batman. At the beginning, it was, uh, we had a password with the security company, which is no longer there, so I can tell you, it was three geeks and a dream. My dad always had this big, not burden of responsibility, but he always had that weight on his shoulders if he had to keep the store up and running. As time wore on, re as reality started to set in and became very obvious how difficult it was to keep this business going, that dream, of course, became something of a nightmare. Um, when I was a kid, my dad came home at 9, 10 o'clock at night, and you know, then I'd go to bed. 
but you know, I'd always wait for him and he'd always be up for another three, four hours doing something for the store. You, you, you really did have to sit back and wonder, is it worth it? You know, it would have been easy to continue to practice law, let somebody else worry about the fact that there's no more paper in the copier. Maybe it's time to open my own sushi shop or whatever it's gonna be. Um, something where I don't have to get up, I don't have to stay up till two o'clock every morning. I don't have to get up so early to run to UPS and fight with them to try to get my stuff. All bills must face the same way. But at the same time, I never had to get a haircut again when a senior partner told me to get a haircut. And I like my hair long. Who? Sko, the, uh, the, the final owner of the store. Oh, 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 the guy who plays Minesweeper. Right, um... I don't know how I would describe Steve. I still haven't put that puzzle together yet. Uh, sarcastic, bitter, <laughs> angry. <laughs> There's some of a lawyer in him, I think, that still survives from when he was a lawyer, and, and that part of him is the rule-based Steve. He doesn't really seem to fit the mold of the guy that you know in a comic book shop. Steve owns a retail store, but hates people. Steve. I don't know, it depends on the day, you know, of the week. You never know how he's gonna be. In the time I've known him, he's either hated the world and everything in it, or has loved everything. He's just a, he's a nice guy. You know, I know that's such a bland thing to say, but it's so rare. You know, there's times where I've come here and he'd either be closing up because he was really sick and he would stay open just for me, and even then he would find the time just to talk. Steve is what a good comic book shop owner should be. Um, a little bit mean, a little bit spiteful, and willing to grab books that he knows you'll like and put them aside for you, just because. Steve has actually found the balance between being a nasty prick and being a nice guy. <laughs> I took those exams, those, those quizzes of which supervillain would you be, and I'm always Dr. Doom. I always come out Dr. Doom. Mountain Dews from around the world. Here's a Japanese can, still filled. Shape like a bamboo, uh, about the size of a bamboo thing, but Steve is uh, a cynical idealist, a hopeless romantic, hopes for the best in people, but expects them to disappoint him. He's definitely someone who will, who will recognize that there's a bad side to almost everything. You give him a gold bar, you'll complain about how heavy it weighs. You, uh, you slight him, or you insult him, or you betray him, he'll file that away in the gunny sack and carry that around, and a number of years might elapse, but he'll pull it out of the gunny sack real fast. You know, I tend to think that Steve is one of those people who has a certain demeanor, but actually feels very differently. He might deny this, but I see him as such a man of love. For all of his quirkiness and his odoisms and his bizarre relationships with crazy women. Sonia. Valerie. Uh, crazy Amy was around for a while. Amanda, Amanda, Amanda. Would I prefer if they weren't crazy? You bet. But then again, I might be bored after three months. So uh, a little crazy is fun. Steve Odo at the end of the day is a very dear friend of mine and someone who I think um, doesn't realize all the good qualities that he has in himself. I think that the person Steve is is a good person and but I think he sort of always strives for greatness, uh, wants to be uh, larger than life. Listen, I, I I have my professional problems with him and I have my personal problems with him, but I'd be lying if I said that I didn't learn a lot from him. You know, Steve's been a friend uh, and, and that's rare to find in someone who you, you know, you just, you, you, you just go to, the, you know, to buy stuff. So. Yeah, I, you know, I, I fully intend to invite him to my wedding, so I mean, you know, he's, he's a good guy, a good person and I consider him a friend. 
we get an interesting cross section here. We get people who just don't seem to understand that we're closed on Tuesdays or that we open at 1 p.m. on Wednesdays. Um, 2 p.m. Now 2 p.m. We don't. Fine. So we have. <laughs> well, fuck. You know, shit. I'm one of them. Or just wants to influence the night. Hey. Yeah, nice. hey. 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 As soon as I walked in the door, I knew that I was home. It was like finding my comic book store soulmate. I just saw it and I knew that this is where I was going to be happy. Oh, my experience is that this is an alternate reality. I come here to escape from reality and I find this store very accommodating for that purpose. You know, to be honest, sometimes you go to comic book shops and you know, it's, you feel like, you know, there's like a loser vibe going on. It's like kind of like sleazy or like, you know, just this is cool and like friendly and normal. You don't really have to be a geek to feel you fit in. I moved recently to Nurshell and I actually live two blocks away from a comic shop and I still drive here every Wednesday. It's, it's sort of like a bar. It's like Cheers. And we know everybody's name. Some of we don't know their name, we just know your number. I'm like, Steve, it's me, Drew. Who? Drew Proto. Uh, number 360. Oh, hey, Andrew, what's going on? He's on a first name basis with, I would say, probably about 75% of them. And, you know, they, he knows the details of their life and they know the details of his. I was coming here enough and I was seeing the familiar faces behind the counter. And I just got the guts to say, hey, I'm Zach. And I just introduced myself. And I'm really happy with that decision because it's kind of stuck. When I come in, I feel like it's like a Cheers-like environment. Everyone knows your name. Everyone's like, hey, Zach, like as if I were Norm or something. You know, there's usually a few good conversations going on to either in, eavesdrop on or get involved with, you know. There are times when I come in here, I'm here five minutes. I pick up a few books and go. There are times when people are talking and you end up spending half an hour, 45 minutes, or I know there are a lot of people who spend a lot longer <laughs> than that. It always seems like there's a chair for someone who can sit down and, you know, relax for a little while. In here, I feel like I could come in here and stay the whole day and it would be okay. They wouldn't be able to be a movie because we weren't so passionate and supporting them with our dollars in their original format. I'm, I'm more introverted, but I've been able to start up conversations with total strangers here because I overhear them mention something and then we get into talking about, oh, what do you, th oh, have you heard this? What do you think of that? Well, I think movies you know, like Blade and yeah. stuff show that it doesn't matter if it's a comic book or not. Well, it's a good story. Yeah, but people, people Blade didn't also see that. But comic book fans weren't the ones that made that big. It was well, people also, who were like, "That's a cool action movie." Well, yeah, but uh, something like that with Blade, he's generic enough that he can appeal without having to be like, "Let's change it." And yeah. He's a guy who's fighting vampires, action, sci-fi, whatever, fantasy. But Captain America, he's a comic book icon. His wings are iconic, you know, yeah. his character, his heart, his soul, his being a frail weakling who wanted to do best for his country. Not that he's some guy who is in the USO and that's probably where they're going to shoehorn their classic costume and then he's going to be like, get me out of this terrible thing, this is cheesy. And like, that's like, look, look, we did put it in there, guys, you wanted that costume, we put it in there so that he could like take it off and think, I got to get out of this, I'm going to redesign one that's functional and stuff. You know what, it needs to be functional, I, I understand that he's in a war. At least I'm just hoping, fingers crossed, that when he comes to the modern times in Avengers, they'll get something a little more classic 616 universe, have the damn wings. It's not going to be where you're going to lose a huge portion of the audience because they're going to be like, the guy's got wings on his head, I'm not seeing that movie. A, a lot of things I tend to notice about comic book fans are that they like to talk. They like to talk a lot because they think they're experts on a particular subject uh, or because they're happy to know someone else who likes the stuff as much as they do. I know I'm guilty of it. I mean, obviously, you, you know, there are people who come to the store and they don't talk to anybody, but they come and they take it all in and they're just, it's like being in a museum to them. I, I'm not big on, on that kind of customer relations. I, I'm sure there are people who come in and talk about, I'm not big on talking about my comics, it's just my obsession. As long as you don't piss Steve off, you're good to go. So why did you just buy all your stuff in the back? I was going to, but I have, I have, I have a lot of bills too. Why did they get paid first? I'm paying them a little by little by little. I just, I max out my credit cards because I had to get my uncle a birthday present. You don't have to get him a birthday present? Yeah, I do. Why? If they wrong him by, you know, not buying their comics, I mean, he feels actually personally injured by it, it seems. And he, you know, that's why he declares them dead. Would, would I wish ill on them? Sure. My biggest pet peeve with Steve was uh, he never, he always fought 
against confrontation. Steve recently canceled my file, and I think it's because I haven't been in here in a while. He's angry at you or someone for something that you don't even know what the hell just happened. Again, I haven't had a conversation with him, which I guess would imply that he, he will avoid a, a confrontation if need be. Our contract was I pull the books that he asked me to pull for him, he buys the books. Not that I pull the books and then he comes in and decides whether he wants to buy these books. And I just take a loss. It feels bad, you know, it really does. It feels like I, I, I've been kicked out of the tribe, so to speak. I understand it from an accounting point of view, from a finance point of view, I really do. But I don't know. I always thought he and I were closer. Maybe it was just in my head. His, again, his business doesn't make or break me, and I don't need it, and I don't need the aggravation. The aggravation is, I'd rather take the book, rip it in half, and say, here, you can have it for free. I get more satisfaction out of that. I'm really into the Pyrrhic victories. I think Steve loves to hear people's stories, loves to share his stories and his life events with people, and I think because of that, it fosters conversation. There's people here. And that's why I come back. That's why I don't order comic books online. That's why I don't just shop for graphic novels on Amazon. It's because of this movie. Incoming transmission. It's got to be something important. It's Heitner. Incoming transmission. My relationship with my customers. I wish Steve was excited about Free Comic Book Day. That's my only complaint. Oh my God. Freeloader Day. People who are into comic books already shop at comic book stores. People who don't buy comic books see that there's free stuff to be given away and then they come to that store that one day and that's the only day all year you'll see them except for next year when you have free comic book day again. And they come in looking for free stuff. And again, the stupidity of the human race is such that they come in and they think everything in the store is for free. Not that there are comic books. And they're looking at these books and say, oh, you have to pay for these? Yes, we have to buy this stuff. They don't give it to us for free to give it away. And that's why it costs us money to give this stuff away. And it's like, why should we do this? And that's why I don't like participating in it. Um, it really is freeloader today because you've got guys there who will take the entire pile. It's the same book. Well, they take the whole pile. I think they can walk off with it. And that's why I have to put signs say one per customer or limit two per customer. Or I put a sign that says, don't be a pig. Um, because that's what they are. And again, if they never shop at my place, they never shop before. They never will again. So it doesn't matter to me if I piss them off. Free comic book, the best one we ever had was the day we didn't participate and they had the doors closed and went to Sean's wedding. I really wanted to set a camera up just like this from the inside where you have the people and the sign will say closed. But they'll still come and they'll tug on it and then have that Bleh! look on their face. And say, oh, they're closed. You can, you, you can hear the dialogue because I've actually been in the store with the lights off listening to people outside talking. And it's like, wow, self-rule, what a waste. The most legendary customer. Well, you, got, you, got, you got Billy Harrington, I've always been fond of. There's only one, it's Jeff. Most legendary is Jeff Wong. Jeff Wong. <laughs> Number 63, Jeff Wong. How can you talk about customers and not talk about Jeff Wong? Jeff Wong is a living legend. Jeff Wong is absolutely the most memorable customer I've ever encountered here. The story of Jeff Wong? Um, I guess he started off as a, as a, a, a way back when, a student, I think, at uh, Scarsdale High School. Jeff appeared one day yeah. out, of the, out of... As if he had always been there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll do what you want to know. And you can have him in the store for two hours, you know, feeding you, uh, talking about whores and killing people, and buying a and buying good selection of Archie. That man never met a lie he didn't like. From owning a Humvee with a 50 caliber gun mounted on top. Originally bought it for, I believe, I believe it was like 40 grand, okay? We drove around for a little while here and there, and then I had it shipped to Taiwan, put four tanks into the Humvee. I believe we had to go to a military base for, for the stuff, but we, uh, we mounted, we can put 250 caliber machine guns on top. We put a siren into it, tinted the windows to the point that they're illegal. Um, the whole thing's bulletproof, fireproof, 
I got tired of it. I got tired of driving it. Sold it. Sold it to some guy on my street for 200 grand. Casey says, does it have GPS too? Which is actually a legitimate question. <laughs> and Jeff turns to him and goes, uh, cut the shit, Casey. I guess he just didn't understand what the hell it meant. <laughs> but like, wait a second, this is the one thing that might actually exist if you had actually owned these things. Having two separate police women who were his girlfriends and both were named Amber and both of them had the same tattoos. But they don't know about each other. He does one of these. Yeah. She's gone. You want to talk a little bit about no. the Amber's one? No. No. What about the second Amber? No. Both of them are gone. Done. And that he and his uncle are part of some sort of a uh, some sort of SWAT like team. I'll buy, okay, I'll go to like a crack house, or whatever, or on the street or whatever, and I will make a buy. Let's say I make, like, maybe I'll buy maybe 15 grams of um, weed, cocaine, whatever. I just, all I have to do is say a secret word. Any, any, any kind of cigarette word. Uh, there's Gargamel. Gargamel. Like from, from the Smurfs? Mm -hmm. And you see like 50 to maybe 250 agents throw me in. So I'll get arrested with everybody else. But then he'll drive me like maybe a half mile down and on coffee. The first we ever gone was up to Canada. But that was a making an arrest. In Canada? He ran. He ran. I'll say 30% is based on fact. Another 30% is completely exaggerated based on that fact, and 40% is just completely made up. <laughs> it's fast, but there's tragedy too. It's like he's won and lost. Alpha was sitting in the truck trying to negotiate to the, um, the, the drug lord, whatever. And I sent one of my teams out to go around and try to um, talk him down, talk him come come out. And. Both of them, I didn't know, I didn't realize both of them went. They both got sniped. Dead. I called up a few friends of mine, very close, ton of reds. I told them what happened. And they said, how many, how many people do you need? Because uh, we'll come in full force. Uh, I, I originally said 50, because it's a big house. And he said, you know what, 50 is not enough. We'll bring 300. Even though he... It's on the spot. It's not on the spot. I really think that it's, he's ready to tell a story when he walks in. What's interesting about Jeff is that once you start talking to him, the longer you talk to him, the more desperate he gets to try to uh, impress you. So the more outrageous the lies get. And you can have him co like confess to murders. How many people do you think that you killed? You know? 25. Sorry. Oh, I know. We had a visit the other day from one of the Greenberg police guys. And he was talking to uh, Jeff for a little bit. And after Jeff left, he was going, boy, that guy scares me. Frankly, you don't know whether they're true or not. They're, they're so outrageous on occasion that you're like, how could anybody make this up? I'm sort of convinced that somewhere along the way in the future, we're going to find out that everything he ever said was true. I'll be 34 this October. Coming from my perspective as a psychologist, I should probably be a little more empathetic and sympathetic to, to Jeff. You feel fucking sad for the guy. It's amazing, though. But you know, Jeff is a good-natured guy, and he's he's uh, he's in his own way, he's sort of hardworking. Okay, as for right now, I'm working at Terror Town Fridays. Uh, the September will be my 14th year in the company. You remember the time that we uh, took he, he we went out to Fridays and yeah. he used his discount card for the entire yeah group? he fucking took care of us. Right? He took care of us. Jeff took care of us. Believe it or not, if if you needed something done, you go to Jeff Wong. And said, listen, I need you to handle this. And he'll do it. it. Don't give him the hardest thing to do. But somehow it's like, I need to need, get this over there. Really important. It'll get done. <laughs> Anything else? While we're headed to Joker's Child, I think you'll notice the, the difference in the way he runs it. Uh, there's probably not the same kind of camaraderie. Uh, Did you have a question? I was just going to purchase. Be happy to take your money. 2757 out of a piece of plastic, thank you. Um, it's a clean store, I gotta admit, it doesn't look like a warehouse like us. People come in, they, they see a, uh, a filthy, decrepit store, it sticks in their head, oh wait, that's that filthy, decrepit store. So, 
We don't like that to be that way. I've been to a lot of comic stores that are both filthy and decrepit. Steve, your story is actually not that. It's a little dusty. <laughs> little dusty. We got James and the Giant Peach toys up there. Who the, who the fuck has seen that movie since it was in theaters? Pretty much we had so much junk at the store that uh, we just needed to start piling up all these statues that weren't selling after a while. And uh, if we were to just keep it at the store, I think uh, that space at uh, regular retail rentals would have run us about 400 a month. So here it's about 250, I think, and it's still throwing away money, but not as much money. Spent a day here with Tom one day, made him lift up all these boxes. We labeled all the, the contents of all these uh, cases. Basically, we moved every box in the warehouse to the right. Other than that, we have always the ever popular Submariner Bowen statues, of which we have so many that we have our own water polo team. It's like the worst statue I've ever made. Ah. This is the 1970s Captain Marvel, which is also popular. I know people are always asking about it, but to, to make an extra $20 on top of regular retail, it doesn't seem to be worth it to give it up. That's just the collector in me. I, it's still hard to give it up. But one day I will, because one day I'll sell everything. Uh, I tell myself. I suppose we're not, not going to have to worry about uh, any kind of flooding. Maybe a fire. But it's a blessing sometimes, right? And there you have it. Another piece of the kingdom. How would I describe the store as a member of the community? The store is a bastard. You've seen the Peanuts cartoons, right? Pigpen. The store is the abused child that we all love to piss on. The store is a hoarder. It hoards anything it gets its hands on, you know, cardboard, stuff that never sells. But it, it's friendly enough that you, you would still talk to it and consider it your friend. I think it's more like a club, club or clubhouse than anything else. It's not like I'm going out with the comic shop guys. It's I'm going out with my friends. Where did you meet your friends? I met them at the comic book store. You know, even, even when we speak, we say the store. We all know what the store is. But we'll convene at the store, and then we'll go out to dinner together. Drink up to burn tonight. Bring through my sternum caving in to a thousand birds with that one stone. Ignore their calls. Give them a skin that's worth the shit. I'll never learn to ask for. Do you go out once a week, really? Yeah, pretty okay. much. Okay, okay. kind of cool. I, I definitely think that much of the reason we get together on Saturday nights in the group that we do has to do with Rich coming in. The, the goal of the night is to get the Rich Roney seat, which is the seat right next to Rich Roney. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. I think everybody recognizes that Rich Roney is probably the nicest guy you'll ever meet. I mean, one of my best friends is Rich Roney, and the guy's as old as my father. It's, it's weird to think like that. And it sort of changes your perspective on what a friend should be. Even if he doesn't give a shit about what you're saying, he will put on a face and he will, he will make you feel like what you're saying is the most important thing being said right then and there. And I still don't know if Rich Roney's a secret agent who's killing people. I really don't. How much do we know about Rich Roney? Almost nothing. He's not married, has no kids, lives by himself. We know he's friends with Steve Odo, and that's really all we know for sure. No, sorry, we know he drives a Pontiac. That's another thing. We don't know much else. Conservative, liberal, Batman, Superman. Batman, Green Lantern. <laughs> Had Steve not sustained this store for this long, uh, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. It's, it's amazing to think about that time is really going very quickly. Um, again, uh, there have been a lot of people that have come through the doors, a lot of good people, a lot of not so good people. Um, don't see most of them once they're gone. Marty was a friend of ours, a friend of the stores, 
from uh, way back in the beginning. Um, big toy collector, funny guy, hated most everybody, but if he was a friend of yours, he was a great friend. One day, he got a call from his fiance, uh, and uh, he had gotten sick, and it only took a week. Diabetes and, uh, and I guess a blood clot went to his heart, and that was it. He was young. Well, we try to make the pilgrimage out here once a year. In fact, we have every year. Uh, he died on June 9, and we always try to come on that weekend. Of course, this is Jewish cemetery, and this place is closed to the public on Saturdays. But we always manage to sneak in, because it's the only time I ever come out this way, and uh, always manage to put something Green Lantern related on his uh, tombstone, because that was his big favorite thing. But, there you go. Still alive, you could have had the whole set. <coughs> you just uh, think about him a lot, and I guess that's the best way to remember him. See you next year. Before security comes, we gotta go. <laughs> so my wife's take on my my hobby, as I you know, my comic book collecting, is not very supportive, or not as supportive as I might like it to be. There's a stigma with comics? Get the hell out of here, really? I don't like that y your mood is dependent on whether or not you get to read enough hours of comics a week. One of the interesting things that I have in my collection that I'm very excited about is a set of Green Lantern cufflinks that my wife, who even though she doesn't love the fact that I love comics, was kind enough to buy for me for my, uh, was it birthday or Christmas? For my birthday. Um, so that's pretty cool, pretty neat. Well, he says all the time that he wishes I like comics so that he can have someone to talk to you about them, like 24 seven, not just when he's at the store. But at the same time, he doesn't let me touch his stuff, so. How would you describe the way I am with my comics? Oh my God. <laughs> well, you're very protective of them. We had to rearrange the collection because it was too hot in a certain area and you felt the comic books were warm. If I had to describe Sean's room at his parents' house, I would describe it as a good place for a 15-year-old boy to live. Why is it a good place for a 15-year-old boy? What's wrong with my room? it looks like a child's house? room. It has statues all over the place and posters of men in spandex. Right above the bed. Right above the bed. Is that weird for you when you um, spend the night? It's very weird. I don't spend the night. <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> this is my, I just finished up my 11th year teaching here. So I've been teaching here for quite a while. I used to have the standard baloney English teacher posters on the walls. And quite frankly, I was bored to tears. And I spend a lot of my life in this room. So I figured, you know what? It's my room. I want to make it cool for me. And I know the kids will think it's cool too. So I started to just uh, envision a comic book store kind of motif. Even the lowest readers and the most disengaged students are coming by and grabbing a couple comics and reading them. And I feel like if they're reading anything, they're learning something. And at least they're off the PS3 or the, uh, or the Xbox. Are there any positive things to my collection? Is there anything you can say good about my collection? What can I say good? Yeah, like, like... I'm gonna get some money when I sell it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how you doing? Welcome to my man cave here. Come on in, gentlemen. Welcome to my home. Just a collection of uh, comic book crap that I've collected over the years. This is the vault back here. Back here, we have approximately 172 comic boxes, long boxes. Um, basically, I collect over a hundred titles a month. I enjoy my hobby. It's expensive. Um, like I always say, it's better than drugs and alcohol. My wife knows where I'm at, what I'm doing for my, for my comics. I just enjoy them. I really do. Okay, now this is the first room. Every comic that I collect is, re is represented here, in this room. When I started collecting, I just collect the comics. I never collect the statues. And I used to see the statues in the comic book store. I used to, like, I used to be like, who buys these things? <laughs> you know, do I shop a lot? Yeah, I shop a lot, but I don't go out and buy a $500 pair of shoes. <laughs> you know, and there are statues here that are $500. It's a lot of money. How much do you think would be acceptable to spend on comics a year? A year? Or, yeah, realistically, 12 months. How much do you think would be acceptable to spend on I comics? I think you should not buy comics. So we'll move on to the next room.
You have to ask my wife what she thinks about me having two rooms of this. You know, I think he's done it nicely so that it's not offensive to me. Um, am I thrilled that it's two rooms of the house? Not so much. He doesn't have a lot of vices and he doesn't have a lot of hobbies and this happens to be it. You know, I like shoes, he likes comics. <laughs> so. Um, I love them. I don't know what they're worth, but they're worth a lot to me. That's all I know. So that's it. When I got into all this, didn't really happen until maybe the late 80s, early 90s. When I bought a little PVC figure of Nightcrawler and that just, you know, then they started coming out with more and more crap and I just kept, you know, collecting. And then by the 2000s, that was it. I was gone. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was off somewhere. <laughs> I tried to get as many posters and, you know, like a couple of Avengers clock, glasses, buttons, just a little bit of everything, you know? And uh, obviously I have a lot of a little bit of everything. I try not to buy anything retail. I try to buy everything at flea markets, tag sales, swap meets, eBay, and um, get it for less. The, the only thing I regret is I, I just don't have an, I don't have enough room for a, you know, more artwork, more prints, more original artwork. My wife is very cool with this. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't. You know, when we first met, I didn't sit there and say I collect Marvel comics. One morning we just got up and I just rolled over and started reading a Spider-Man comic. And she was looking at me and I was like, what, do you, you have a problem with this? And she was like, no, it's cool. You know, she's like, you just, you just don't seem the type to read comics. I'm like, good. <laughs> yeah, most comic book fans are depicted as, uh, I live in my mom's basement and I love comic books. Uh, if I could just meet a girl. Uh. But that's really not the way most comic book people are. Is it crazy? Yeah, this is freaking nuts. But I'm happy with it. <laughs> you know, this is my kind of nuts. In my head, yeah. in my head, we'll have a, a gigantic room devoted to the man cave. It'll have wall-to-wall -wall bookcases filled with trade paperbacks, hardcovers, everything like that. What do I think it will really be in real life? It, <laughs> if I'm lucky, it'll be a closet in a room. Odoisms, the Dow of Odo. I and I truly believe this, even though some people think I'm crazy. But I think that after all these years of you know, working and living and such, I've developed a certain amount of knowledge. Um, the Odoisms are the crazed manifesto of a deranged Asian man forced to work in a dirty store with a bizarre cast of characters coming in every day. Okay, Steve has these uh, little sayings he calls Odoisms, that he says he lives his life by. It's a very accurate representation of his philosophy of life. I think some of them are spot on and are very revealing and very true to his personality. I think others are over the top and he deliberately presents those just for humor. He doesn't act like he takes them seriously, but honestly I think he takes them more seriously than he leads us to believe. You know, when Alternate Realities made our website that we haven't updated in like four years, but when we made that website, the first thing that went up before pictures of the store were his autoisms. When you put them all together, I mean, you get a pretty good picture of who Steve is. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It's something like, you know, don't run for the train. Or Odo doesn't run for the train because another one will come along in 20 minutes or some, something like that. That one I got a kick out of. I thought that was pretty funny. The buzzers are going and people are running past you to get that train because it's a signal that the doors are going to shut and they're going to pull out of the station. I believe one and Steve Odo will never run. Is that it? I found that if you run with, with the pack to try to catch it, either you'll get into the train in the last car before the doors close, and then you've got to walk down the aisle through every other car to get to like the 
the first car in order to get a seat if you're lucky. Uh, well, my, my favorite uh, is the, what is it, Steve Odo does not run, I think is the one of my faves. Or the doors will close on you just as you get there. And you have all these people standing there or looking up at you as you're standing there sweating. And they're all thinking, what a sucker. No, Steve Odo does not run. That is a credo I think he can live by. And that's why I don't believe in running. I think running, it didn't, it didn't do anything. It just uh, left you there sweating and looking humiliated. Well, well I always prefer to animals to humans. Humans are hopeless. That's uh, true. lost cause. Animals, they love you, especially dogs. Dogs always love you no matter what. Cats are okay. They don't care. We'd be standing outside, it'd be like 28 degrees, 30 degrees, and I was fine in a t-shirt and jeans. Um, it was when it got to be about 23 degrees that I noticed that I started to feel a little chill. Everything has some value to somebody. Might not be the full retail value, but somebody would be willing to pay something for it. That's, all right, then explain the fucking James and the Giant Peach thing up there. I. Yeah, no, what it is is that Steve eventually goes away to Japan for a week, and that's when everything eventually sells, or gets thrown out, or sells for a dollar. <laughs> People don't know what's involved. Everybody thinks the comic book store is a great place to be, a great place to work, great place to, great business to own. They have no idea what goes on behind the scenes and how deadly this business is. Wow. That's wow. He would rather spend 80 hours working 50% of the time than spend 40 hours working all the time. I think it does take a lot to run a store. I think anyone who has enough time to Skype and spend hours on Facebook not the hardest working man in Westchester. You know, people come in with a box of books and he looks through them, they think they're gonna make a million dollars, and it's worth five cents. A, a very good issue drops dramatically at about six dollars, five, six dollars. So if you sold to somebody for that, it's a fair price. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't feel guilty. Um, if you sold for twenty dollars, then you should go to church and ask forgiveness. Now you've got it down to a fine art form. I know, it's fun, man. It's always yeah. fun. Your ability to go for the juggler and crush them, shattering their hopes? Glass. Oh, sound of glass. I'm not going to get a steak dinner out of it. <laughs> this is almost worthless. Alright. Okay. Again, there you go. I don't, I, I don't do it because of just pure enjoyment. I, you know, there's just also the reason is, uh, I think people need to face the, the facts that most of what they've collected is worth crap. Yeah, but that's not. Yeah, but that's just him telling the truth. So I don't know if that can, is necessarily shattering dreams as much as being an honest man. So you're driving along, and a squirrel comes out onto the road, and he sees you coming. But he he stands there, and he doesn't know should he keep on going to get across the street, or should he go back where it's safe? And so he, he decides to go, keep going. He freezes and says, oh, maybe not. So he starts going back to where he started. But then he said, oh, wait, I can make it. And he turns around, he goes back and forth, back and forth, and they'll finally just make him flat. You don't want to be a flat squirrel. You don't want to be a flat squirrel in life. If you decide to go for something, you just got to do it and not hesitate and, and second guess yourself or third guess yourself. Yeah, he's right about that. Yeah, he, yeah. That is actually one of the few lessons I took from him. It's weird. But he hesitates all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I've hit a couple of dogs, I, I squashed a cat, um, I remember a raccoon looking right at me in the headlights. I've hit a couple of deer, uh, but again, they ran out in front of me. Um, there was a bird, that was kind of a weird one. This guy jumped out in front of the car, I mean, that, that really bothered me. I just had this image, like, you know, Bruce Banner, David Banner, you know, town to town, wash dishes in this place, make a few dollars, help the people there, and then move on to the next town. If Steve were to walk the earth, he would barely make it a mile. How far did I get? Not far. Maybe to his car. <laughs> the second traffic light. How far is his home from here? Probably to home and that would be it. New Jersey. Steve Odo the legend? would make it to California. Steve Oda the man would probably make it to maybe the Tappan Zee Bridge. Does he? No. 
Uh, well, I don't buy that. Come on. That's a lie. <laughs> that's a lie. <laughs> God, that's such a lie. Bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's not true. Never call on a Wednesday. God help you if you do. Uh, never, ever, ever, ever call on a Wednesday. We, I learned that the hard way. I dial, and as it's ringing, I go. Oh no! Don't bother him on a Wednesday. And he's, yeah, he's very ferocious about that. Can I look in the camera for that one? Never. And then he picked up as I was having second thoughts. And it was like, you know, that slow motion in the movies where you like try to run to stop it. And I went, hi, Steve. Do not call on a Wednesday unless you have a vagina. Hey, I apologize for calling you. I am really sorry because I know I'll pay for it. We're, we're all terrified of you. <laughs> what do you want? You know it's Wednesday, right? You know it's Wednesday. I was like, yeah, um, just wanted to tell you. I wanted... Good, thanks. Come back. Don't call me on a Wednesday. You know, I got, I got too much to do. It just, it frustrates me to talk about it. And I never call that Wednesday again. Actually, I had one guy who was bleeding. That, that uh, I called 911. The deadliest catch. I know Steve likes to make the analogy to the Discovery Channel deadliest catch show, where this is a boat and he is the captain and we are all just crab fishermen to him. Let's unload. Full pots, very heavy, lots of crab. At first I didn't know if he would take him seriously or not, but after, you know, fourth or fifth, uh, you know, discussion and detail, I, I, you know, I, I'm thinking he's embracing it and doesn't even realize why. As I watched it, I said, wow, it's, it's just like running a comic book shop. In Steve's mind, it's a very apt comparison and real similar environments in Steve's mind. The captain basically has to decide where he's going to lay his pots, or the crab, where he thinks the crab are going to be caught this, this particular season. And that's like my going through the order form and deciding, well, how many of these comics should I order? How many should I not order? Or should I just skip this one altogether? What will sell? What won't sell? I find that offensive on the face of it. I find that just grossly offensive. Offensive? 
well, he's a fireman who can't uh, get, on, what, two steps on a ladder without falling down on the second day on the job? Good grief. You know, does he wish he could live that life of adventure? Or is it more that he's kind of organizing his adventure here, you know, instead of the safety of law? Steve sees himself as the captain of the USS Alternate Realities. And he's out doing dangerous work. He's putting books in folders. It's hard work. And it's not, it's not for the weak. It's not for the meek and the mild. And oh, oh, the best thing though is like when the heat's not working at the store and it's really cold in the store, it's like being in the Bering Sea. It's very cold. Kneel before skull! Fuck you! My spoon! My spoon! My spoon! My spoon! My spoon! My spoon! That's what keeps me in business. Jay Mizell, when I was a young comic book collector, there weren't a lot of comic book stores in Westchester County, and uh, he had the flea market in Portchester. Oh, I used to read comics in the Second World War. I mean, I'm, I'm older than I look. And, I, you know, that was the old bit. My mother would come in, lift the cover up, and there I'd be under with a flashlight like <laughs> that comic book under the cover. He was a crotchety old guy who's always been a crotchety old guy. Soil. What is that? Soil and green? Made out of people? No, no, no. The pig from a... Uh, never mind. I don't remember it. <laughs> Another great anecdote. Something about a pig's ear. Silk from a pig's ear? No, that's not right. I love Jay. I think Jay, deep down, has one of the biggest hearts, is one of the most generous, kindest guys, most caring individual. But he masks that with the mouth of, you know, a, a drunken pirate. Uh, it would just slip, uh, a, a four letter word here or, or whatever. But then after that, he would just like look around to see if there was some little kid or, or a woman that he didn't want to offend. And of course, it's very amusing for us. I think very few people have been so offended that they, they, they took a dislike to, to Jay. What do you think of Jay? I think he curses too much. You think Jay curses too much? Yeah. He you have a bad girl kidding. online, screw this shit. Fucking technology shit. Apple's at 268. Good for Apple. Yeah. Take an apple and shove it up your ass. Okay, thank you. Put the wrong fucking lettuce on here. Dumb fuck. Come on! What? Let's go. I'm waiting for you. You're in a pig's ass. You're waiting for me. Come on. Zero July zero five. What? Are you finished yet talking to yourself? Yes. July zero five zero two three two. What did those little shitheads damage while they were there? Poor little six-month-old kid who got killed by a fucking branch in Central Park. Yeah, that's sad too. Of course, that's sad. The 1800 schmucks that died from the swine flu, get out of here! What, are you gonna go through life undying? Undying? Undying. Oh, the great undead. Like this undying. is a delicious sandwich. Yeah. It's always entertaining to come to the store on Thursdays or Mondays when he's here. I'm Italian and he, he has yet to say the word gnocchi, correct. So it's ganaki. Jay Mizell is my favorite old guy. Okay. Wow! What? That rare roast beef, that looks gorgeous. Tell me when you can hear. I haven't heard since 1973. I knew a Robert Simmons. Okay, you have to ramble on, don't you? <laughs> That's when I called Ted Kennedy a schmuck. I had a cousin once who was down in Georgia for a month and she had an accent after that. Very nice woman, but that was a fraudulent accent, man. Jewish girl from the Lower East Side goes down to Georgia. It's out of a month, but she didn't marry, she married a, she married Joe Delinsky. From Waynesboro, Georgia. Was this the girl of your dreams? This was my cousin. And the funny thing about him is as rough as he is on the outside, we all kind of came to realize that he's probably the nicest guy in the world. This I doubled up on you? Yep. Yeah, because I had to get this again. You know, I know this guy has his shop on Central Avenue and, uh, <laughs> you know, he's got... <laughs> Steve? Is that his name? I didn't know his name. The guy, uh, the, the Oriental guy on Central Avenue. <laughs> Batgirl number nine. Thank you. What's next? Do you know how many Jurassic Parks we sold? 20. Zero. I sold four. True Blood, where you can buy the comic book. <laughs> and Alternate Realities, 100 copies I ordered. Wow. I thought it was Twilight. Zatanna. Number what? Two. 
Is three <laughs> out? Three is not out yet. Then two, just two to begin with. We are sold out of twos. Shit. You, uh, does Diamond have it? Well, I can look. You have to wait. Yes. No yelling for a while. Okay. His booze at the flea market, however, um, is a hot mess. Started in October of 78. Today there's nothing here except crap and me. Jay Mizell sets up at the Dirt Mall, which is what we call the Porchester Flea Market. Over the years, my customer base has dwindled, as you would understand and expect, primarily due to the change in ethnicity in the area. He has a booth where he sells his comic books to um, the Latins, as he likes to call them. I hate to sound as though I'm uh, Joe Bigot, but I'm not. It's just the, uh, the cultural difference right now. I mean, hell, if these people, pardon me, if these people read English and, you know, read anything, I wouldn't get what. And here's Jay with a 7x7 box filled with comics in no particular order whatsoever. But basically I do it to keep busy, to insult people, which I enjoy. And also this business, if I go out of business, what the hell do my customers do? The best description was when one of the other store guys went to visit him one day and had gone to see him and said, uh, well, Jay, I don't want to keep you from your customers. And he goes, customers? Customers? What customers? He's a browser. He's a browser. This guy might buy something. And it's that type of, uh, of uh, atmosphere in his place. I love when people walk in and they walk around for 20 minutes and they walk out saying, gee, you got nice stuff. How much do these go? Ten bucks. Do you sell uh, tapes? Or? No. I, I'm the guy with the pictures and the movies. I'm the guy with the tasteful things. I don't sell tapes of today's crappy movies. I'll try to order another, but if you go, I'll get stuck with it, I know that. If you don't come back, you gonna come back? Yeah, well. Mom, how am I? I'm simply marvelous. I'll give it to you cheap because it's last month and I've been holding it for you. Oh, yeah? Yes, because you told me to take the wizard and you never showed up. I'll give it to you for course, don't worry about it. What do I owe you? Nothing? Oh, exact show, yeah. It's you believe it? Beautiful, thank you very much. Good seeing you. Stay well. Yeah, it was so long ago, my God, it was 1978. And it, uh, you know, we, I've been here ever since, for want of uh, any other place to go to. My father worked until the day before he died. I guess I will do. Sei gesund. <laughs> babies, I think sometimes they're two weeks old, they're being schlepped around his thump. <coughs> and the only unique booth in this entire place is me. And I hate this, that, that may sound as pretentious as all hell, but it's a truism. I once pulled the kid's zipper open. I don't mean his jacket zipper. Like anything else, like any kingdom that has a despot as his ruler you know when I'm gone it's gonna get taken over by somebody else I'd like to say that I don't think he'll ever sell the store but I've been wrong before I think that we are getting it's getting closer to where he's gonna he's gonna be you know want to walk away than not closer than ever than all the threats I think ultimately he wants to sell the store and be done with it and just be one of the guys I don't think Steve would I don't think he would sell the store Definitely not. Um, this is definitely his home. You know, this place has sort of become like a part of himself. And I, this is what he does, this is who he is. He's the guy who owns the comic book store in Scarsdale. He, he's in a relationship with the store and I don't see them getting divorced. I see one of them being a widower. I just don't know which one's gonna go first. As far as the store in the future, you know, the way it goes, it's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, if it's supposed to continue on, it will. The store has never changed. It's always been that constant you know, in my life, you walk in and you feel like, you know, you could be in high school or college again because, you know, time almost stands still in there. And, you know. Yeah, I think that's why I avoid it sometimes. <laughs> no, seriously, it's like yeah. ghosts, you know, it's, uh, you can't go home again. I was angry for a long time when I was working here. I was angry at Steve. I was angry at the way the store was. I was angry about a lot of stuff. And it wasn't until like three years out that I realized, like, I learned more about being an adult than I thought I did working at that place. Because in any job, you got to work with people that you think are fucking crazy. 
And if I can deal with Steve Odo, I can deal with a lot of fucking crazy people in the city. It'll, it'll be sad when the store one day isn't there anymore. And I think when the store actually closes, that's when you're gonna see, you know, what are the friendships that were really made and are people still gonna get together? When it's a matter of making four or five calls to different people to get together as opposed to just calling the store and asking Sean on a Saturday night what's going on or showing up at the store to see who's getting together for dinner, you know, that's when you're really gonna test, you know, what, did, what does the store mean and what are the friendships that came together uh, mean and what developed out of the store and this and that. It, it'll be interesting. It'll be, it, it'll be fun to see and at the same point you get a little worried and say, you know, is it gonna be the end of an era, as it were. This store can't close. Just can't, just can't. I decree, done. As any fan would tell you, comic book stories never really end, and the tale of alternate realities is no different. If it has taught us anything, it's that even a dream made real doesn't always bring you happiness. That sometimes to be continued is better than happily ever after, and that you should never, ever call Steve Odo on a Wednesday. But perhaps the greatest lesson is that, in the end, it's about the people you meet along the way, especially when those people are more colorful than even the pages of a comic book. The only thing that kind of bothers me is if I shut down, it's like, what, where are all these people going to go? I think deep down Steve realizes that the store is more than just a place of business. It's a, a home for people. It's a family. We can say anything we want about each other. We can say anything we want about Steve. But I feel like we're family, and we're the only ones who are allowed. There, there's, there's a nice, again, paternal sense that uh, the family has, has grown and are moving on and becoming successful in their lives. I can't think of any other um, life experience that's been more important to me, actually, um, than the store. How many places you go where you make friendships with people who either work at the store or shop at the store? Almost never happens anymore. If I had to encapsulate everything about this store uh, into two words, I would say friendship and fun. The things that I've done which I, weren't great and uh, not proud of, but uh, I, I don't regret because it led on to the next thing, the way things are supposed to be. And you know, um, um, great experiences because I went one way and not the other. Uh, I could have I gone the, the straight and narrow and all this other stuff that happened would never have happened. Um, I think everything worked out for uh, the way it's supposed to be, and uh, I have, you know, knock, <laughs> knock on wood all day. Uh, it will continue to be that way, and um, no, I don't really have a lot of regrets.
<laughs> Don't put this in the movie. Don't you dare use that on camera. <laughs> Can't put that on camera. I say it's off. It's off. I by the way, this off you better cut out. Get that out of here. <laughs> Steve's gonna kill me. I'll, ne I'll never be able to come. If you put this in, I'm never coming into the store. Uh, I think I'm gonna pass on that one. I'd let you defer that to uh, your interview with Steve. I think I'm gonna pass on that one. It just makes me feel worse because it's like pleading the fifth. You know he's guilty. <laughs> Dude already hates me, so I don't know how far, like, when, when we're watching, if we're watching this now at the theater and uh, Steve's behind me with a gun, you know, shout something so I have a chance to get away. So far I acted as he's been working, I have I can't talk straight. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Excuse me. Hopefully you can do some B-roll and cut that out. But, you know, some things stay the same. And you know, some things never change. So, I mean, I think I just said the same fucking thing. But uh, <laughs> we created the uh, the Scofax, and that's like that's a, um, a compilation of his uh, his I would say this is crap. <laughs> we gotta do this again. Steve spanked me. He took me in the back, he bent me over his knee, and he spanked me. I, I just don't want to be spanked. That's going in the movie. <laughs> I am the worst defender in the store's history. Mine's about... Mine's about eight inches thick. Eight inches thick? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely a place for, you know, love really hardcore fans when they need to come in. Sorry. <laughs> Are you a film major? Any chance? No, I go to law school. What? <laughs> so what's the other one that you put? I well, I you have, is that a real gun? Oh no! I, I wasn't even there. <laughs> <laughs> he he sells comedy. Oh my god! What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Ready? Here we go. Wait, I gotta need a second. <laughs> he sells Pokemon and comics to everyone we know. Oh no! Oh.